Hey, good morning. Doug Padger Radio, broadcasting live out of the Twin Cities on August 19th of 2012. So if you were supposed to do something important on August, on uh, September, did I say August? <laughs> on September 19th. <laughs> September 19th. If you were supposed to do something important on September 18th, and you're just now remembering you're late. I always think about stuff like that. Do you worry about I'm, I'm here with Victoria. Hi. Victoria peterson Hillicue, our today's fill-in sidekick. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Doug. Um, uh, do, do you ever think about stuff like that? Like some, some day is marked on your calendar and all of a sudden you're thinking like, um, oh, oh my gosh. Oh, my yeah. kid's birthday. Yeah, well, yeah, your kid's <laughs> birthday or an anniversary or something. Do you? Do you, do you worry yep. about that kind of thing? Well, it happens to me all the time. Is that right? So are, I have to get really good at appeasing people. Are, are you truly somebody who does forget um, yes. activities like that? Yes, yeah. truly I am. Like like someday you'll you'll wake up in the middle of the night and there'll have been something important that that went on and you think, how could it be that I have forgotten that thing? Yep. On this on this terrible the day. The worst, most degrading saying is when people say, "Oh, you would have remembered if it was important enough." Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. It makes you live in shame <laughs> if you're forgetful. I understand. <laughs> Uh, hey, uh, we uh, normally have John Music sitting in with us, but John Music has uh, important things to do today, <laughs> so he, you know, he can't. Kind he of can't, forgot about. He this. can't be around, hanging out with us on this on this lovely day. It is uh, it is September, and September has come to Minnesota, and it is now fall like. Um, in fact, today looks November ish. Mm -hmm. This this is the kind of day for you, Victoria, as a poet. I would think that you would like write some really it's good. The perfect kind of day. Yeah, you'd you'd write some really good poetry stuff today, where you'd yeah. be like. Um, you know, getting into your... I'm pretty sure I'd be writing brilliant poems now if I weren't here. But getting, oh, would you? Is, yeah, is that, you think I'm so? Sure, you think yeah. you'd be all... Um, I think the great American mm -hmm. poem is not getting written. Is being is being Because skipped, of John Music. Is being <laughs> skipped a little bit because you have uh, to play around on a radio show. Well, we're going to be joined. We call this religious radio. That's not quite right. And we're going to be joined by two religious commentators today. Religious commentator one is, is Ani Zanaveld. Ani is an emerging Muslim. And we're going to talk to you about this crazy business going on in the Middle East. We're going to talk about the culture of being offended and how for us as North Americans, very often we don't understand how someone can go from someone says something bad about your religion or your prophet to you should kill someone, right? Like that seems like such an enormous jump that I think to a lot of North Americans, it makes that culture seem barbaric. Right. Like it's disproportionate to um, uh, of, of a response. Right. So people just uh, we, do, we don't understand. So I want to ask Ani to help us uh, think about is that a, a cultural thing from a, a certain region? Is that a, a cultural thing formed by Islam? Is there something about Islamic belief that should be a counterbalance to that? Or is that what gives permission to it? Because people I hear people say all the time, like, well, in the Muslim world, and I think Ani might have something to say about this uh, this notion of the uh, of the Muslim world. So we're going to be joined by Ani, and then uh, at uh, eleven o'clock we're going to be joined by a fellow named Charles Drew, who wants to talk about something ra rather similar. Actually, he wants to talk about the the politics politics in the United States and can Republicans and Democrats share the same church and what would it take for them to do so? So should there be some compelling Christian religious impetus that should overcome uh, partisanism like a big brick wall in between in the democrat side and the republican side is well one yeah of his recommendations no well he says that i think we should we should ask charles about this i think what he's going to say is that something like that exists and it shouldn't mm -hmm. and he would even say it might not be a brick wall. I'm putting totally putting words in his mouth because I've never talked to him about this. But this is what I want him to say. This is what I do to guests. Right? I have them on my show to see if they're going to say the I'm thing. Send him a text quick that, that I want them to say. And I don't even know this guy, so having to put words in his mouth is really is really a tough one. But his book his book is called Body Broken, and uh, it's a play on is the body of Christ the church broken over politics, right? That's his idea, which is a play on words. For those who don't follow religion, it's a play on words for mm -hmm. Jesus' uh, body being broken in, in death and then that being represented in, in communion with the breaking of bread, which really, uh, from the time I first got into Christianity, really seemed like the most underplay you could have for an act, an action that's supposed to tell this <laughs> other story, right? Yeah. So you tell this story of like human 
human agony and suffering. And then you can apply lots of meaning to it. You can apply meaning of there's some cosmic exchange of God and humanity. You could have the big meaning being that um, an oppressed person is defeated by, um, by powerful entities. You could have it be that a human being is giving up his life for his friends in sacrifice. You can give lots of meaning to Jesus's death and, um, and, uh, uh torture and, and we exchange and, wafers you know. and then what people do is they get some bread <laughs> they and they crack it or they or they take a loaf of bread and they rip it apart and they're like kind of same be thing at least like a slab of bloody meat or something right like a, well yeah it just it, i mean <laughs> doesn't it i mean i know that to religious people we've just become so accommodated to it it's it's like uh it's meaningful enough but if if you're not into that and someone's like well what, what are you doing with um you know cracking the wafer <laughs> Or in some places, they don't even crack the wafer, right? No, they just, just hand them one. It's just, just a little, skip the crack. yeah. <laughs> or at our, you know, around our church, we, we take bread and we, we don't do the narrative of. I don't know if you've noticed this at no, Solomon's porch, but, this. but but we don't do we don't use the language set of this, your body broken, um, uh, kind kind of thing. So we use another story, and um, but but this idea that like you're t- taking bread and ripping it apart, which people do every day. Right, like with a sandwich, Jesus. yeah, and that somehow that is supposed to really tap into the same struggle and angst of dying, suffocating, of, of suffocating and dying in a brutal crucifixion. Yeah. It's so anyway. He has this book called Body Broken, where again he's playing on the, he's he's playing this phrase, and I think what he would say, and we'll ask Charles if if this guess is right. Um, I think what he would say is there's not a brick wall in your congregation where the Democrats sit on the left side and the Republicans sit on the right side, but rather there's brick walls between churches. So I think what he's going to say is, can you, can we have a kind of Christianity where people don't basically say, I go to a Republican church or I go to a Democrat church or I go to, I, maybe someone goes to an independent church. I don't know. Maybe a couple of the Mennonite churches or something would be the would be the little. <laughs> I'm trying to think about what church that would be. Like if you had urban churches, like your classic sort of urban Democrat voting church and your classic Republican mm-hmm. voting, you know, third ring suburb church. What would be like the independent church? Maybe somebody should Quakers. should 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 let us know that if you if you're Quakers a, or do they? I think yeah, maybe Quakers. I I think they tend to stay out of the. Uh, political conversation altogether, don't they? I think I think they like to be a bit above that. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know about here and now, but if over history, I mean, they te- they have been political. I mean, they were big in the mm-hmm. uh, abolitionist movement. Yes, mm-hmm. and they tend to stand on the what I in over history what I view as the right side of the issue but, of slavery. Yeah, mm-hmm. for example. Mm-hmm. So, and with uh, women's issues too, in terms of mm-hmm. that's right, uh, it being an egalitarian mm-hmm. religious mm-hmm. community. Yeah, did you know that the Quakers? I just heard this from a new convert to Quakerism, so I don't know that this is true. Because sometimes the new converts they they, you know. they don't get it right. They well, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not a Quaker, so I don't know. But she, I thought she was a lifetime Quaker, and she said she just gotten into it two years mm-hmm. two years well, uh, ago. Sometimes they're the best ones because they didn't all kinds of research. Well, that could be. So that's why I've granted this to her, as she's probably right. But then I thought, well, you're kind of new to this, maybe not. That the the whole Quaker, because I said she, she said, I, well, I'm a Quaker. Uh, we were talking about something, and she's part of a Quaker church and a Quaker movement. And I said, well, thanks for the oatmeal. Mm-hmm. To which she didn't even smirk. I mean, there wasn't a smile. And um, her boyfriend uh, then said, oh, yeah, she doesn't think that stuff's funny. And I'm like, seriously? Like the Quaker oats and stuff? You don't think that's funny? And as it turns out, the, Qu- the Quakers, so I said to her, well, you know, in the late 1800s, there was a big movement among many religious traditions, many new religious traditions, because in the late 1800s, it was sort of the flourishing of new religious expressions. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you know your American religious history, you know that Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and Scientology and Christian science and 
and a bunch of other ones. These mm-hmm. these little monastic communities that would live together, a bunch mm-hmm. of Germans getting uh, farmland and mm-hmm. living these communal lives. This was all happening all over the place, and the Quakers sort of had a a real part in that. I mean, they were really uh, they were really vital from the middle 1700s through the middle 1800s. And I said, well, there were many of those efforts that had uh, some pretty significant commitments to to health. Like it was a big deal because mm-hmm. they thought that you know you were seeing the end of the the end of the 20th century uh, dawning and you're seeing the height of human civilization and all this. And she said, well, actually, the Quakers had nothing to do with oatmeal. Did you know that? Nothing at all. She said, the reason is that Quakers were seen as honest people. So if you could brand your product as Quaker, then people would be like, well, those are some honest, straightforward fellows over there. So the Oats people who weren't Quakers just stole the name and made it Quaker Oats so that people would think they were getting a fair deal. Mm-hmm. How do you like that? Classic American marketing right there. So when was the last time, this might have been the last time, but when was the last time that, some, that anyone knows of when a religious tradition and denomination was seen so highly, so highly <laughs> thought of, that they wanted to that brand? people making products were like, you know what we want to do? We want to steal your name and use it for our brand. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? You know, I think... Doug, Doug Paget Radio, Religious Radio, is ripe for branding products. I yeah, mean, that's right. this is the... You know, I have, you know, I've tried to think of many, many rationale and reasons why I would start my own full-on religious tradition. You want cereal named after you? Well, you know, at some point, like somewhere between a guy having a good idea and someone being the founder of a religious tradition, the, the, the Wesley Brothers, Luther, Calvin, mm-hmm. Zwingli... Uh, some of these Quaker people whose names I can't think of right now, <laughs> um, Mary, ba- Mary Baker Eddy, all these people, right? At some point, they, they, they go from being somebody with an idea to like the founder of a whole religious tradition. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you have to like pass through like being the weird cult leader for some mm-hmm. period of time before you get to be that, right? Like how do you get to be, how, how do you get to be that guy? Because I was thinking, well, maybe, uh, you know, Maybe it's time to start up a new religious tradition of some some variety. You know, staying within the within the big broad strokes of religion, but but you know, start something fresh. Just, I mean, do these did any of these people sit around? And do that? I think Joseph Smith did. Like, I think Joseph Smith <laughs> he, sat he around. Gets credit for a new thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I think he sat around and said, "Look, I'm I'm starting something. I'm starting. I'm I'm doing a whole new thing. I'm I'm rolling out a new brand here. I think." <laughs> But the I, minute I seem you're to have that suspected sense. of doing that, you're suspicious and you get booted out. Like, you have to believe it. Oh, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Or just be committed to it. Right? I mean, G- isn't really the thing, because I think you're on to something, but isn't the thing you're really on to that somebody really has to be committed to it? And one way you become highly committed to it is to really believe it? Yeah. But you also can't be conscious of becoming a thing. I mean, it's like becoming a saint. The minute you want to be a saint... You're immediately oh, I disqualified. Think all those people, I think all those people are bucking for sainthood. I think as soon as they knew there was sainthood come, you don't think John Paul, you don't think Mother Teresa had sainthood in their in their purview? Oh, no, I don't think Mother Teresa did. All right. Well, maybe not when she started, but down the road, you don't think she was managing her I, I think her she sainthood, would have up her sainthood little stuff and fled. I don't think she could have handled it if she had thought about it. Really? I don't think she had the temperament. To you don't, huh? I don't think so. Well, we, you know what we should do? We should get a Catholic scholar on the show sometime. Yeah, because they would know. Maybe a couple of them. You know, people <laughs> that spend their time like noodling around on like her private diaries and stuff. But that woman was awfully, she was awfully publicly, pu- awfully uh, public relations savvy. She didn't miss a beat. I mean, she found ways for, ev- you know, for her message to get out. There were mm-hmm. a lot of, there were a lot of nuns working in a lot of places with very needy people because the Catholics have a, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, as rich of a tradition as any human endeavor on caring for people, for sure. through serious self-doubt and... um, And she even let that out. Yeah. Well, well, now I'm getting beyond what I really know. Uh So I don't know how much it was in her private journals or revealed after her death. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know either. I'm just kind of making that stuff up. But it just—it does <laughs> seem to me that she's uh, that she was hot. So anyway, we're going to talk to those two people. We're going to talk to Ani Zanavelt, and we're going to talk to uh, to Gary, no, to Charles Drew. 
Remember Gary Drew? I feel like I know someone named Gary Drew. But we're not well, going to talk to Gary. Colin we're going to talk Gary. to Charles. <laughs> and uh, and actually, actually, I owe Charles one because somewhere in the communication of scheduling our conversation for today, um, uh, it was going to work for us to have a conversation last Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And then I changed the show, went to Memphis and did a show with Phyllis Tickle um, and had neglected to tell Charles and his um, public relations person that Whoops. they weren't on last week. Uh-oh. So here at 11 o'clock on Wednesday, my phone starts ringing. It's poor Charles. Like, hey, I thought we were supposed to be, uh, I thought I was supposed to have a radio interview today. You should send so, him a little package. Yeah, I should send him a little package. package. I want to talk to him first and see, see, if, he's, see if he's willing to razz me about it. Because, like, what if he's just a really sincere guy? Then I have to send him a totally different thing yeah. of apology. But if he's, you know, if he's willing to, you know, have, to gauge have a little type. fun with me, then I could yeah. send him a whole, um, a whole a whole different thing. Send him a whole different thing. All right. So so we, we were, uh, you know, today I almost I almost did a, a heroic thing. Uh, spe- I mean, maybe this is why I think people like, you know, religious founders and saints have have their eye on the prize from the start. I walked out uh, to my car this morning to uh, to drive up to the coffee shop because we don't make coffee in our house. Why? I don't know. We don't. We're not coffee drinkers. Somebody should fix. We're you are. Like, I, I, see, here's the thing. Like, I I normally I I don't make it in my house. I have it in my office at church, and I have it when it's prepared by professionals mm-hmm. or <clears throat> restaurant tours. And so. it often is better that way. So. Oh, I think everything is. I was at, I was at Whole Foods <laughs> with Shelly yesterday again. Trying, I mean, I, I seriously need therapy. I need therapy around why I, I get so panicky in grocery stores. I hate them. I, I don't They're know terrible what it places, is. Are nobody? they? Oh, absolutely. And you and I are both married to people who love grocery stores, which is lucky for us. That's probably part of why our DNA picked the other one because we couldn't survive without going to grocery stores. But. Well, so, what do you start to yes, hyperventilate? I or well, yeah, I, I don't know. I get. Um, I think I mean I keep I keep it to a I keep it to a reasonable level like the, you know people don't have to come out and, and help me any longer uh, you know, <laughs> escort the, the, you from the yeah, store. That, that, Sorry, that sir, rarely happens right anymore. Um, no, I get I get anxious. I get and I'm not an anxious person. And I get mm-hmm. I get uh, I get uh, frustrated. I just I, anyway, um, all of that to say I, it all leads to having to cook things at home. And I think mm-hmm. part of <laughs> Making coffee is just more than I'm willing to do. So anyway, I went outside today to get um, to, to get in my car to drive uh, two miles to the coffee shop. Um, and there was a there was a gray cat walking across our driveway, kind of a uh, not long hair, not a Persian cat like I grew up with, and not a short hair, but whatever's in between, mm-hmm. a mid mid length shoulders bangs, um, <laughs> <A> bang. <laughs> a cat That's with little nice. bangs, little, little beetles, <laughs> little beetles esque cat walking across the road, and uh, I'm like, why is there a cat? Because we just don't have feral cats wandering, and this looked no. like a house cat. You live I mean, in this, Dino, right? this, yeah, I mean, our, our cats have places of their own. You know that, or people shoot them, and. Do they? Is that something you know? No. Oh, you got me all excited right there. <laughs> Maybe there was like a news story of people shooting <laughs> random wandering cats in the city of Edina. Um, no, but, there's, but there was this cat, and I said to Shelly, uh, leaned back in the door and said, there's a gray cat s- standing in our driveway. And she said, oh, that's the lost cat. Like, there's a lost cat, and he's in my driveway, and all of a sudden I'm into something. Um and I was going to get gonna, out your cape. I was going to get to be the hero, so I said, "Get some tuna." And uh, <laughs> so Shelly started opening tuna. I went out the front and kind of got a little leaf in my hand, held it out. The cat stayed put. I walked up, picked him up. He didn't like me holding him. And Shelly said, "There's a big sign." And some other neighbors were talking about someone had lost their cat. And I said, "Okay." So I put the cat in the car and started driving down the way to um, uh, see if I could find this sign and the phone number. Because I was going to deliver the cat. This was going to be my big radio story that today, I, I mean, as someone who doesn't care for felines right. as, a, as a whole, like I was rising above and well, saved this catapulting cat. Catapulting you closer to sainthood. Catapulting, did you say? Yes. See, you're a poet. That's that <laughs> clever poet stuff. Catapulting. So I, I drive down, and there's a giant sign uh, down there, big, big print, uh, lost cat, gray with white chest. Uh oh. This wasn't the lost cat. Oh man. Now I just have a cat in my car. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I hope you were still nice to the cat, even though I, I was. See, know. that's what makes somebody really a saint. 
when they're still nice to the cat. Really? It's not going to get Because you know what? I think Mother credit. Teresa, she wouldn't have even told this story. That's what I think. <laughs> she would have just, she would have scrapped it oh from, the, from the annals. You're going to make uh, me start doing some Mother Teresa research because I actually kind of. I, I mean, I'm all for her. I, th- I think she's great. I think she's tell about all the good things she did. So anyway, I, th- then I then I came and now I've got this cat and a bowl full of tuna. <laughs> now what am I gonna do? So I. So anyway. What'd you do? Just put it. Out. I put it on the driveway and. Yeah. Your driveway. Kick the cat out of the but car. You still no. managed to get coffee. Yeah. And then then I then I drove up and got coffee and came back and I guess the cat was gone. Yeah. So I don't know what was going on in this cat's mind. I mean, I don't. Th- I <laughs> unlike some of my friends, I don't think cats have full deliberative. Uh, mental capacities but this cat must have been a bit confused about the whole thing like i called it over i picked it up then i put it in the van then i drove it for a little bit which freaked it out i think he thought it was going to the vet so he got all nervous probably peed in my van didn't even look for that and then um i drive him back here and pop him in the driveway and gave him a bowl of tuna and drove off it was a confusing morning for that cat. Yeah, that yeah. cat is going to have to go to its psychologist and get its meds up. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Hey, today's a big day, you know, uh, in the for the the Apple iPhone people. Oh yes. I don't yes. know if you keep up on this sort of thing. Well, I, you, I did notice some buzz on Facebook. And yeah. NPR. It's coming. It's a coming. New one. Well, what's coming? To, to, that's good news for all of us who are iPhone users. Is the iPhone six mm. operating system, the iOS six. So the iPhone five this version of the of the hardware comes out this week but um but the the operating system the big upgrade operating system which has lots of things to it comes out today see this is the kind of look i get from people i get all excited about this like for two weeks i've been like following blogs and and websites about all this stuff and i know all these features and i get all stirred up and i try to tell other people about it and i get that look right there it's like so the look at a party when you start talking about running and- so tell us, so get us excited. It's, yeah, it's just a What's lot of things. What's it going to do? It, it, it reor- What's it going to do for me? It, it's going to give you whole new functionalities in some of the things you, you, are, you are used to with your calendar and your mail. Maps so I won't are going to be whole things new. as often because it's going to help me. That's right. It's going to now, it's going it, to, it, 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 it has a feature where it will uh, walk across your house and tap you on the shoulder and remind you of things <laughs> that you've forgotten to do. It's a whole new reminders app. As long as it does it has nicely. little legs that come as out as and it comes it over it. Like pound on me. Yeah, it just taps Victoria. and says, "Victoria, I don't mean to interrupt, but you did say three days ago that you wanted to go to the grocery store today." Um, so that's kind of a big deal in the whole um, in the whole uh, technology world. And I mean, that's it, it's just a reminder, right, that things things keep getting better. Mm-hmm. Hey, we went and saw that exotic marigold, the the, oh, the yeah. greatest. What's what's it called? The greatest exotic marigold hotel. The best exotic. Oh God. See, this is why no one sees that movie because they're like that movie about the hotel. Uh, at your recommendation, you and yes, Brent and uh, Brent. Shelley and I went uh, on Friday and loved it. She even said last night, "I want to go see that movie again." And there's this great line in it, which I don't know. I wondered if you had looked it up. Um, it, the 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 sort of star of the movie, this Indian fella, has this saying about, uh, "In the end, everything will be all right, and if things aren't all right, then it's not yet the end." Yeah. You remember this? Yeah. I mean, but it was, I don't know who that or what. I don't know where that came from. Like, is that an Indian Hindu kind of saying that in the end, everything's going to be all right. And if everything isn't all right, it's not yet the end. Because I love that, uh, that, yeah. that notion. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. It's not going to be over till. Till it's, till till things are right. right. Till things are right. So, I mean, it, it, it's sort of simultaneously, um, uh, keeps you going and then also says to you yeah maybe not in your maybe your time the time you're you're rolling on is not the time that um that uh, all things are going to be made right i am a bit too just dark hearted like though to hold on to that too much really yeah a little bit why is that it just it's hard to believe that everything could be made right i mean there's a lot that's wrong in the world how could we ever get to the place someday where everything is all right well, consider the trajectory. I mean, go back a hundred years. Granted, you have to remove all of you know NBC's retelling of the life of the Little House on the Prairie people. Um, but go back a hundred years; <laughs> things weren't so great for a lot of people in 1912. No, it's go true. back 500 years; things weren't so great for people back in you know 16. 
hundred. It is. It is possible to argue that there is a trajectory of, even though there's a lot of things that are still wrong, that things are improving. You mm-hmm. could make that case. Other people make the other case, though. They do. Yeah, or are they, or are they just so. poets. <laughs> Those <laughs> my friends. Yeah, yeah. Are they? Are, are, are they all? Are, do they all wear little berets? Well, it probably depends on what, how you really believe humanity, like the root of humanity. Do you really believe inherently that people are good, or do you inherently believe that people are? Bad. I mean, inherently, I think people are intended to be good or intend good. Or See, really I think good. people should have to be outed on that all the time. I think you should have to wear like a name tag. <laughs> I think people are really a pile of shit. Or I think people are really quite grand. Because that would solve a lot of problems. And, and I don't think you get to be in between either. I think this whole like, well, I think you're kind of a combination of the two. And nope, that moves you over into the... Uh, <laughs> Because I think you should know that, like right off the bat with somebody, you should be like, "What do you think? Do you think you think I'm the trouble, or do you think that we're I'm part of the solution?" Yeah, it would just cut out a lot of arguments. Like if you just knew that as a baseline. Yeah, because you spend a whole lot of time trying to poke around with people, figuring out what do they think about that. Where yeah. are they on that trajectory? Yeah, and, and I'm I'm obviously clearly on the on the side yeah. of um, people. People are frail. People are limited. People mm-hmm. have. Um, made choices that then preclude preclude other choices from being available and demand that certain things happen. So I I, mm-hmm. I get that. Mm-hmm. But this idea that um I mean I'm 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 a full convert to the idea that that um people aren't the problem. So what really is the problem <laughs> do we have to well, some people are the problem, I think, is what I've concluded. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, you're well, making me realize that my belief doesn't really fit. Like, I have two inconsistent, mm-hmm. incompatible mm-hmm. notions, and i got to throw one out. Yeah, and there's some people for whom they're, they're like, well, it's hard for me to imagine the goodness in all people because I'm so dark. And then there's folks who are like, it's really hard for me to consider the goodness in all pe- in, in all people because those other people are so awful. Like I'm okay, <laughs> but those people they're they're really troubling. And then others are like, everybody else and maybe they got it together, but man, I've got I've got darkness. And I think what it what it requires is a reorientation of what darkness is. Oh. As, as a metaphor, right? Darkness is clearly right. a metaphor, and it's not a very good one because it's been used to subtly and overtly condemn people of darker countenance and skin color. Right. Right. So that whole dark light metaphor for goodness and um, badness, that's the, we probably shouldn't use color nope. in that, in that sense, but, nope. um, but that, but that, but I, I get what people mean by sort of like, like the darkness in them, meaning that, that, that un, those undiscoverable um, places. Well, and then the, another factor is some people believe that there are forces outside of humanity or outside of us. There's other forces at work. So some people argue that... Like cats? <laughs> no, like the, in the spiritual, like spiritual warfare, mm. other kinds of forces. So some mm. people make the case that this isn't just oh, about see. what we choose as humans, that there are these other... There's this present darkness. Exactly. Remember that book? Did yes, you recall I do. That? I yeah. read all those back in the day. Mm. Frank Peretti. Did Is that, that uh, do, do you think that influ- helped, not to influence, do you think that helped to solidify your thinking on um, the world that we live in? Solidify? No. Like, do you find yourself being someone who um, is comfortable with the notions of... No, I'm not very comfortable with the notions of spiritual things happening. You know, like like that there's a, like, there's an other realm, like there's electromagnetism, and then there's well, some spiritual force right, and that's then also evil and evil angels and good angels. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Do, do, no, do you like I don't that? really know how to understand those things, but I I do think that in terms of like science or of that there there's energy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And it influences things. And so I don't really know how to. So it it might be like 
sort of like some cultures would animate or humanize mm-hmm. certain forces. Mm-hmm. It might be that that kind of spiritual realm of putting particular names or qualities to spiritual forces helps people try to understand it, mm-hmm. like in a, this present darkness kind of thing or whatever that book was called. Mm-hmm. I don't know exactly, but it's easier for me or it seems more viable to think in terms of energy and force than that. Yeah, things right. there's a ripple effect mm-hmm. things are connected if everything's kind of connected in a certain way mm-hmm. uh, at least on a like molecular or particular kind of way yeah. then things influence each right. other like it, it does seem to I'm not one who holds to this <clears throat> that there are um, created angelic beings of goodness and darkness goodness and light or go- goodness and evil that roam <clears throat> the earth in another plane and then affect mm-hmm human endeavors but <clears throat> there is something about that that human beings have used that imagery that picture to help explain mm-hmm. their experience mm-hmm. right um, not necessarily to explain the origins or to answer everything but to give some context to it so there does seem to be something mm-hmm. that's up there right there um, like <clears throat> that many people can't be that wrong for that long they can't be that completely be long, r- wrong, right? There's <laughs> something there. And I've been quite uh, affected by this whole notion of, of space-time continuum mm-hmm. stuff. So, so I actually think that there are um, effects of our behavior that tend to live on. And maybe that's what people, mm-hmm. what people mean, Right. So I think there's like it does feel like sometimes you can step into goodness, like you can just sense it and feel it mm-hmm. and anticipate. It. And sometimes there's something that's just dark and evil feeling and heavy weighted mm-hmm. um, that that you can f- sense and feel. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that like if you're picking if one is picking that up in their physical with with whatever receptors our physical body has, mm-hmm. well, that might really be indicating that there's something up. But but like, what is that? Mm-hmm. Right and so and kind is of a some, gathering of a yeah. lot of certain kinds of energy and then yeah or is it just bad it? interpretation you know that like I was in Haiti recently and loved it I mean I felt so enlivened by Haiti after an earthquake and everything it was just mm-hmm. it was a it was a, a magical time and place in a really great way and I have friends who had been in Haiti five and ten years ago and they would describe sort of the darkness and heaviness and weight mm-hmm. and oppression of Haiti. And, and so I, that, 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 that's what became intriguing to me is, well, how does one person find it to be invigorating and another person finds it to be so, so yeah. weighted? So. All right, well, we've got to talk to Annie Zonneveld. Yeah. So I'm going to call Annie, and then we're going to be talking to Charles Drew after that. So if you're uh, listening to us on Spreaker and you're listening to us live, we're, we're glad that you are. Uh, you're going to refresh your browser here in just a minute, or you're going to refresh your, um, your link to be back with us. If you're listening on the podcast, then just roll over to the next podcast. And if you're on the Ustream video, 